We ask all these things in your name. Amen. If you're picking up this green pipe, grab a couple packets there. If you're picking up the green one, and I deliberately colored it green, that's the color of the walls in my room. And um, I want to do the very first thing I want to do is I made two typing errors in this presentation. And if I don't tell you about them right up front, I'm going to worry about you finding them <laughs> as I go on. So, on the, I don't have the number, but on the page that says color, right here in that, the psychology of color, I left out a word that should say how different colors affect learning and memory. And then, I think I corrected the other one, I drew in a little S on the last, uh, the sticky factor page. I left an S out on that last one. I proved that and proved that and proved that, and I found it this morning. So we're, we're going to talk about, and I, I have on the front of your, number one, there is a, uh, a tree in the corner. Pastor talked about the tree in the corner. I love to put trees in my corners of my room in the summertime. Uh, creating a physical environment that encourages kids to focus and engage with God's truth. And that is, that's our mission. And it's very important. Uh, I didn't realize how important it was to have uh, a room that is conducive to, that helps with behavior and with learning and different things we can do cheaply. I'm very cheap. I do a lot of things with paper and, and uh, insulation foam are my two big things. I never buy, you can go and spend $400 for a uh, pre-made stage, but I use a lot of PVC and rubber cement. If you smell enough rubber cement, that'll help make you very creative. <laughs> but, uh, down at the bottom of that page, on to the left, it says, with, this is what we want to create. We want to create an environment that sets the atmosphere. Number two, it shows that you care. And it helps kids own the ministry. And then the last thing, it says something about your commitment to excellence. And at our Sunday school classes, or some of you, how many of you are, have a Sunday school class? And how many of you are in a junior church or a church program? You've got both of them. Do you have uh, larger classes? Uh, how many of you 10 or less? Just Sunday school class. And in your, in your church program? Well, bigger, yeah. About 20, 30, yeah. uh, 15 to 25. Yeah. Those are great, great size groups. We, um, uh, down at the bottom, it says Titus 2.10. I read this years ago when I started getting a little older. Now I'm in my seventh uh, age. So I definitely am the aged woman in Titus 2. That our responsibility as we get older to teach the younger. And the last part of Titus 2.10 says that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And that caught my eye and I had read some someplace else. I'm always reading and looking things up and, and uh, spending a lot of time on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I had read the, the, this, the last part of that verse, and I wondered what did it mean to adorn? Because to me, to adorn was putting something flashy on, maybe some nice earrings, and that's what I think of makeup, hairstyle. But here the adorn, you know, when I looked it up in the Greek, it's kosmosi, and that means to put it in order and to decorate it and to give it luster. But your goal in doing that is not that, that that's what, what is the star of the show. It's, it just sets everything up to put a child in an environment where he's teachable. And uh, we're, let's get started on this on page 
I made it so you can flip it over this way. I don't know if that's the best way. Let's start at the front door of the classroom. Does it say come in? My workers, uh, in fact, my son-in-law is a children's pastor in Hilliard, and he's been there for about 15 years, and he started out with my husband and myself. And I made a big deal to my teachers that when they were in that room, when those kids came, no talking to each other. You, you are, you belong to those kids. And I would go, and if I'd see them talking just to each other, I'd be clapping my hands going, the kids are here, the kids are here. Because I'm at my door and I greet them. I want to greet them each individually. So that's part of my come in. But if they come to the room, and I might even have my door decorated, I can change it seasonally. I can change it with uh, what I'm teaching, the big idea for the quarter. But from that moment, they are entering a space that's been created for them. So it says, come in. It can be by the color of the walls. The furniture is set for them so they'll be comfortable. It's clean, there's no clutter, and it's ready for them. My pre-session, everything's out, and they and I say, hi, I've got Jenga going over here. I've got all the things I show them, and I say, would you like to play Jenga with me? And I play a little round with them, and then grab the next child as they come in. My current class is just, uh, it's a group of eight first and second graders and uh, so it works out real well so we want to concentrate on the students view not our perception we came to Ohio in 1997 and we joined a church in Gehenna my husband was on staff at New Life Church in Gehenna and I took the hallway that went to the toddler area and I put posters this high all along the wall that led to the two and three year old room and it had pictures of two and three year olds on it and that helped those kids know that this is, this is my space and they would kiss them you'd have to go through with Clorox every week and I'd have to disinfect them because the kids were all over them. It was their space. It was their eye level. I would encourage you to get down if you've got a if you've got a fourth grader, view the room from their eye level. Breaks my heart when I go in a room and you've got kids with eyes here, but everything's hanging up here. And it should be at their eye level. Nothing in my room is above their eye level. Even if I sit back and say, man, that looks real silly to me. I took a, um, well, we're talking about color in a minute, but I took a survey among five and six year olds one year, what their favorite color was. Number one, that year was magenta. Number two was lime green, yellow. Uh, then I think we got into the oranges and reds and blues. Blue was very important. So I took those colors and I incorporated them. When I had the parents come, they just, Ugh. what are you thinking? And I said, I'm we're trying to think like a child. And, and, uh, and it kind of tickled me that they didn't like it. I said, this is what your child loves. But, um, so we want, we want it to be from their view. We want it to say that you are welcome here, that the teacher cares. I want them to know I've, I've cared to prepare a comfortable space for them, that I have thought about them all week long and, uh, and, and being all ready for them. And they'll come in and it'll promote belonging and they will think this lesson is something that I want to be a part of. What's going on in here? I love to collaborate with my kids. And, um, and I, I'm getting ahead of myself in these notes, but I, 
I make a, I have a board and it changes every week. And it's a layer that I put on that's with, that goes with my lesson. So last week it was uh, Mount Carmel and Elijah and the, uh, the two sacrifices. And I had 850, the number 850, and then one. And we talked about, we went through all of it, what the 850 prophets did. And, and, you, and we were in a, a circle situation. And one of them at the end, when we talked about how God came and, uh, and consumed everything, one of the second graders said, uh, may I do something? And I said, yes. And what, what would you like to do? He said, this 850, can I change it? I said, yes. And he went up and he took 85 and he made it 851 here and zero under bail. And that's and, and he engaged in the lesson and having the visual there helped him do that. So it promotes it, it's something that, that he was part of the lesson. And then something that I love is a wow factor. I love the wow factors and I tend to, I have to have somebody keep me in line because I tend to stand on the line and sometimes get in the gray area because you don't want your wow factor to overshadow what's going on. One time I had been at Lazarus when I was a young girl, Lazarus was downtown. And of course they had talking trees in beautiful lights at Christmas time in Santa's village. And then I got older and I had a Sunday school class and I thought, I gotta be just like Lazarus. Lazarus department store. So I had two girls that were in their twenties and my daughters and we put we painted branches white and we covered the entire hallway with branches and white lights. I made a giant snowman that somebody could get into and talk to kids. I had the manger scene and uh, baby Jesus was not laying the way I wanted to, so I had to break the doll's neck to lean out. So I've got this all set up. When a five-year-old comes into Sunday school, he will be scared to death if a snowman talks to him. That was bad. Then a four-year-old wants to kiss baby Jesus. And you pick baby Jesus up, and Jesus said his head falls off. That's bad. So you gotta watch, at least me, I usually assign someone to keep me in line. But you gotta watch what that wow factor is. So over the years, I've been reined in a bit on that. And uh, but, uh, just from experience. But to be creative and to have ideas, don't ever dismiss an idea. Try it. Might not work out well. And you said, and then you know, I never do that again. I decided I wanted children's fingerprints on the wall. <laughs> and I tell my daughters again, we can do this. With the three of us, we can get paint on the wall and not all over the child. So we set it up. And I had the pan with paint, I had a child, I had a daughter with a bucket, and I had a daughter with a towel. So I take the child, put it in the hand of paint, press it on the wall, keep the kid's hand, dump them in the bucket, and my daughter grabs her hand, and then it goes to my other daughter with the towel. And we did 30 kids that day. I usually ran about 30 in my four and five year old class. We did 30 kids that day and not any clothes were ruined. That was a great idea. So then I was feeling, I guess, pretty much I could do anything. So I tell them, let's have the kids make personal pan pizzas next week. <laughs> so we come in, and I'm getting out of my area now. I don't want to talk about the teaching, but that was a bad idea. We came in with our little toaster ovens and everything and yeah and i have a daughter that she's still talked about her burns from that day so do details make a difference yes they do 
And the details that make the most difference, I believe, is to have a clean and an orderly space. Please keep it orderly. Please keep, if you've got little kids and you can't get, I, I like to have everything out before our classroom begins. I don't want my cabinet doors open when the kids are there. I had at one time, I took a piece of fabric and I, it was, I put it over kind of like the, the things you buy for sofas to put your remote controls in, to go on the arm. This lapped over the cabinet and I took uh, page protectors, the heavy ones that I got from Staples and I attached them to this fabric and I had a space cut that I could get my hand down in and I would have my scissors and my glue sticks and everything I needed for they were hanging on the outside of my cabinet. I didn't have to open my cabinet up. So that was orderly. Lighting and temperature are important. If you've got poor lighting or if it's hot or if it's cold, uh, that's, those are important too. Then the color and kid-friendly furniture. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute to flip the page. There are, we're grateful for the rooms we have. Sometimes we're in rooms that you cannot change. Maybe it's used by a different ministry sometime. Um, did you find it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And um, uh, then you might be in a building. My very first class was in the basement of the church in 1967 with a wall that had never been painted. It was concrete. And I thought about that a lot this week. I was trying to think of memories. What's my first memories of Sunday school? And in my mind now, it must have looked like a prison cell. I know there weren't bars on the windows, but that's kind of how I think about it. And I had a little class of second graders, and I had one that was a terrible discipline problem, and being in that little room, it was a narrow room, I stood here, a row of chairs there that did not fit the child. That was the worst situation I've ever been in. So your size of room, your location of room, you may not be able to change that. The color and the wall, uh, the walls and your flooring, you may not be able to go, don't go in and, and decide to paint your classroom paint without getting permission from somebody. And uh, so you may not be able to change that and then you may be in a shared space. Well, I have some ideas of some things I've done with PVC for shared spaces. There's a picture down on your left. We taught uh, 125 children in our junior church in Florida in a gymnasium. My husband constructed these PVC, these are our actual ones, but that's what they look like, PVC frames. And we had uh, fabric that hung from them. We had to put them together and take them apart every week. And it really, we got pretty good at it. And the fabric you can buy from Stumps, I think is the name of the, of the company, they're still in business. I bought it in 10 yard rolls, 60 inch wide fabric for $25 a roll. I don't know what it is now. But, uh, I use black. Then I started experimenting with, with uh, things like, um, you know, it involved fire. Like, we did puppets and we got pretty outlandish and so I had to get uh, fire retardant <laughs> material and somebody <laughs> standing there with an extinguisher. But, um, uh, but they're very easily constructed. If you're in a room and it's used for a school and they push, we had to do this every week, all the desks push to the end, the teacher's desk push to the end, then we'd use sections, a couple sections of these, and we would uh, close it off so that the, the kids weren't tempted to get in someone's desk. And it would be closed off and blocked by these partitions. If you're in a very large room and you just want to shrink it down to a smaller area, partitions are good. 
if you're in a room that's not at all something that a five-year-old would be attracted to, these little uh, connected PVC uh, sections, you can do anything with them. You can use one of those panels to be flannel. Uh, here they have something that they can uh, see themselves in. Uh, you might have one you use for a puppet. Here's one with pockets. That's what I was talking about that I have hanging out of my supply cabinet. Um, but you can put different, uh, do different things with those. And you can make them, PVC comes in 10 foot sections. So you, if you're in a gym, you can make something 10 foot by 10 foot. Or if you're in a classroom and you want it 8 foot by 8 foot, whatever you need. I've got uh, some elbows are involved up in that, in that uh, little photo. To make one section, you're going to need three PVC pipes. I recommend a two inch. Uh, and you need the elbows, the T's to put the leg together, and the caps for the end. And they go, you can take them apart every week. If you're making a partition, you want it to stay together, you're never going to have to move it. You can use uh, rubber cement. And it's, if you turn your page, a PVC project is very inexpensive. These are for one inch here, I pulled off real quick. But a 10 foot pole is only $3.33. The caps, and these are today's prices. The caps, 96 cents a piece. They're all very inexpensive. And you can really make a great wow factor. There's a lot you can do with that. Uh, so it's it's been, PVC is a big part of my ministry. I was the one when Pastor was talking about smoke machine. I had one. <laughs> I was the only woman on my street in their garage. I had laser lights that danced with music, smoke machines. I used to go to the theater and watch the lights spin around and change colors. And I think, I can do that. And uh, I, I kind of came down from that ledge. And because I spent a lot of years that what I did overshadowed God's word. So you need to keep that in mind. Shared spaces continued on the next page. Hang it up, tear it down, repeat weekly. If you are in a shared space, uh, you, you need to take everything down. I spent much of my life with a long pole, those gravit poles. You can buy these little, I have them listed here, the little ceiling hooks that uh, collapse, it says Atlan. Mm -hmm. They go on that, on these drop ceilings, they go on the metal. All you do is squeeze them and they come apart. But if I had permission, I could leave them up there. And then when I come in on Sunday morning, I just take my item and my hook and hook it up there. And uh, of course, I'd have to take it down again. I use um, fishing line a lot. I use ribbon. But, uh, but those, and those are, two and a half inches long and an inch wide. And here you can get a hundred of them for $12.95 on Amazon today. Uh, the fasteners over to the far left, Walmart has those. They go on the same way. They just slip over that metal. And um, they are only two in a package, the large ones. So they're a little pricier. I like the wire ones. I love something hanging from the ceiling. The, you see the, the uh, flowers there, you've got turkeys at Thanksgiving. We should change my ceilings every, every month pretty much. Snowflakes, hearts, um, clouds, um, kites. And uh, so those I use a lot. Then you've got the command ceiling. Those are $2.99. Those uh, hooks. And they stick, you wouldn't use them on a ceiling like this. You'd use them on a regular, regular ceiling. They stick and can be removed. 
but you would put those up there. They come in clear also. Put those up there and you'd leave them up there, but you'd have to get together with whoever's sharing the space with you. I, uh, I make easels out of PVC and in that D do-it-yourself package, I have the instructions for making an easel. And I make um, easels out of cardboard. If you look at a picture frame and just enlarge it in your mind, uh, that's all out of cardboard. I love foam. I use tea pens on foam. And here are 40 tea pens for $7.23 at Walmart today. If I've got, if I'm in a room and the room is not really a color that I like, that I want my kids to be part of, but I can't paint it, or block out a lot of it with the mobile walls. And also, I can, I take sections of, um, of insulation foam, and you buy those in, I think they're, they are four foot wide and eight foot long and a half an inch thick. You can paint those with, make sure you use a water-based acrylic paint. And I can, I can lean them, which isn't good for little kids because they'll be messing with them. Or if you put hooks in the wall and put a little eyelet and glue it down in there, make a hole, glue that down in there so it stays good and solid, get your Gorilla glue out and hang it. You can hang those and then take it down uh, when you leave the room. Or you can do the same thing with wood boards, but I prefer using insulation foam. Insulation foam can be sanded too to give it a nice smooth surface. And then you've got that hanging there and you use your your uh, your little key pins and you can pin things into it. I like um, uh, the easel for the, I don't know if I told you that, the instructions for it or in the do-it-yourself. Um, PVC easels, you can buy foam easels very inexpensively. I know Staples sells them. Uh, you can probably find them at Walmart and Target also. Magnetic boards, I love magnetic boards. There is paint. You can paint magnetic paint on your wall. And if you find it, the color of your wall, you can just paint a stripe of it and then use magnets to attach the kids' artwork for that week. It's good if it's drying, but, uh, but they make magnetic paint. Um, when you cut uh, insulation foam, I heat a knife. I use a hot knife, but a hot knife doesn't give a good clean edge. So then I have to get out my exacto knife to get it good and clean. But if I want out of that eight foot section, I know I'm only going to be dealing with a foot of it. I take a hot knife and cut that stuff. A lot of stuff I used, or at least would try to use my electric knife for cutting turkeys. That'll cut through a lot of foam and things too. So there's some ideas from the ceilings, from the walls, and your turn to effective use of facilities. Things we can change. We can change our furniture arrangement, and we can change the physical environment. We, um, we can set things up to be conducive to learning. I have here a, a table of children's furniture and what they recommend. I, I teach six grade or six year old to eight year old. So I have all of my furniture. The table height is 25 inches. I do not have the ability or the funds to buy 14 inch seat. And if you measure these, you're not going to find them too much off. But the thing is, you want a child's feet to be on the floor. 
if that's not possible, I have also gone, I've been very successful at going to carpet companies and getting their sample carpet squares and at least for the lesson I might have them sitting on the floor in front of me and me in a chair. I don't want to be teaching them standing up if they're sitting on the floor because I don't want them looking like this but I sit in a chair in front of them and have them on the floor. And then I even remembered when I was a Girl Scout back in the 50s we made something called sit-upons and they were just little squares of a, uh, a vinyl and we filled them with newspapers and stitched the end of it and it was something to sit on. If you've got carpeting, you don't really need uh, anything to protect their bottoms. Like if you didn't have a carpeted area, you'd want them sitting on something warm. But it does give them a space where their little rear ends belong. And I space them out and tell them, put your hands out. Can you touch your neighbor? If you can touch your neighbor, move. And I teach them like that. So that's another, if you don't have children's furniture, if you don't have that ability, at least during the lesson time, you can have them seated on the floor. And next page, are circles better than rows? And I, what I wanted to do was to sit us in a circle. We're kind of in a circle now. But if you're sitting in a circle with your kids, I, I really love that for teaching time. It's more conducive to relationships, not just my relationship with them, but their relationship with each other. It's a more efficient learning environment. I'm not standing up, talking over them, not seeing some of them. I'm talking around the square and I'm making eye contact. It compels you to keep proper ratios. We like to have you, I don't know, if you've got a four-year-old class, I wouldn't want any more than six of those four-year-olds with a volunteer if you divide them into small groups. And in my class, when I've got 10 sitting around and it's me, I go, whoa, I need somebody. It makes you aware of that. There's too many kids with just me. So it, it, that does help you with to keep proper ratios. It makes intercessory prayer possible. I had a little one sitting to my right saying, Miss Anita, uh, Maddie, well, I told her about Jesus, but she won't come to church with me. So we just stopped right then. And um, everybody closed their eyes and we prayed for Maddie that God would open her eyes to the gospel and that she would come and go to church. It encourages conversation. I was telling them, be sure now, this is the big idea. Listen carefully. I want you to talk about this to your moms and dads. And one of the little ones says, Miss Anita, you know my attention span. I go, where is this coming from with a two-year-old, or a, not a two-year-old, a second grader. Somebody's told him that. You know my attention span is only one minute per uh, per age. So I am eight. So I won't remember this when Sunday school is over. I won't remember it. It makes guests feel, so feel welcome. When you have a guest come to the door, one of the questions they have is, where will I sit? And if you guide them, and during our pre-session, I guide them to a seat. If we're in a circle, they have a seat. It's not a big decision what table to sit at. So it, it does make them feel, feel welcome. I think it helps the kids attend more frequently. They, uh, I think they make friendships easier. And the number one reason is it gives volunteers or whoever is seated in that circle an opportunity to make an impact. Because if you don't purposely set out to connect with a child, I try every Sunday to have, even if it's a moment, Daniel, did you catch any fish this week? I know he likes fishing because I've talked to him. And it's given me an opportunity to make a connection and make an impact because I am having eyeball to eyeball time with him. 
So that's why I like circles better than rows. Now, if I'm smarter than the machine, we're going to open this section. And I'm not. But am I? The Beat Company handled knows that colors can change the way people behave, so they did a small experiment with kids. Hempel wanted to show that painting the room is not only a matter of taste but rather the children's behavior is affected by the colors found in them. We took a room in a kindergarten, we painted it in acid red, we placed the children in it. They asked them to play the way they wanted. There were no rules. Teachers were asked not to intervene. Children could play alone or together. We wanted to see how children's mood and behavior is affected by the color surrounding them without any adult control. On the second day, everything was exactly the same. The kids, the toys, and the room. Only one thing has changed. This time, we've asked them to play in the same room that we repainted in light blue. In the red room, there was a lot more crying and fighting. Kids were running around and making a big mess. But when the room was painted in light blue, they played together nicely and helped each other a lot. So colors do make a difference, and how different colors affect learning and memory. And I've got a few here. Blue enhances creativity and stimulates a cool and relaxing environment. Do not use in excess, as it can also depress or invoke feelings of sorrow. So you gotta be careful with blue, but I love blue. I had uh, in a four-year-old classroom, I did one wall in a light sky blue and painted clouds. And it was like our stage wall where we did our music against it. Red is a color of passion. It evokes strong feelings of threat, love, or excess stimulus. And I think we saw that in that video. In the classroom, it can be used with other colors to help in detailed, repetitive tasks. I will put a line, um, Awana made these different colored tapes. I'm sure you can get them somewhere. But I put my red line at the front door where kids line up at uh, when the parents are coming at 10, 15. I might define, another thing I've done with groups, I define the area, squares on the floor, and I may have red there, anything I want, red tape, anything I want to call their attention to. And yellow is a color of happiness and sunshine for children. It stimulates intelligence, but do not overdo, as it can make children feel stressed. Green is a color of abundance. It can relax and lead, a be and lead to better health in kids. But that's why I have, I'm so happy I have. I didn't paint it, it was there when I came 
in the current classroom, a beautiful shade of green. Purple is the ideal for kids and it's attention grabbing. When I look at these and I think, used to be asked a kid, what was your favorite color? The girl would always say pink. And then they get a little pink, no, no green, no pink. They're kind of go to an undecided thing. Now I find, especially with girls since Frozen, the thing, everything is blue and purple with kids. And so I know that's the little girl's favorite colors. But it's interesting to call and ask, ask your kids, what color is your blue? What kind of things you got in your bedroom? Find out what their favorite color is. And the last, oh, create a sticky factor. Drive home a big idea. Environments connect with your larger theme. I am teaching Ten Commandments for 12 weeks. The first week, we all learned the Ten Commandments. Every child knew the Ten Commandments in 15 minutes. And I teach it with my fingers. So now I've got big hands. One, two, this week's going to be three, watch your words. So I've got those big fingers. And so that's my connection to my theme. And then add another layer connecting a larger theme. So I, I think this through for 12 weeks, I, I changed this out. And it communicates, this place is going to be super fun. And when kids are wild, it's a win. You turn to the last page, Wowzer Walls. I love circles. These circles you can buy on Amazon for $19.95 and you can peel them off and use them again. And there are 91 comes in that come in that package. She's used them over here, the fruit of the spirit. She's used the circles, and that's fruit of the spirit. River kids, that's for older kids. A beautiful wall there. Be kind to others. That happens to be the one rule I have in my class. Be kind, because it covers everything. So be kind. And then here's a, a one that is changed out for her lesson that week or for the month, the, the idea for the month. So if we turn to our DIY project thing, you can do a lot of things. If you've got block walls, you can take hot glue, put it on the block wall, and stick something to it. You can peel that hot glue off. If you don't, and you don't want to, if you've got bulletin boards, but you don't want them full of, of holes, if you take a clothespin, hot glue, a thumbtack to it, and stick it in the bulletin board, you can open, that's a great drying space if kids have been painting or to display artwork. And I've got an example of that. That happens to be a nice strip that's on top of a magnetic board. And you can use clothespins that way and attach stuff. Thumbtacks, of course, are cheap. And clothespins, I love Dollar Tree. You'll find me there a lot. Hook and loops. That's for us. Hook and loops. You can, uh, you can hook those up and switch out what you've got attached to them uh, on your board. Um, this one, I have two bad spaces down on my beautiful green wall because I used what I thought wouldn't take the paint off and it did. If you take blue painter's tape and outline what you're going to, what you need it for, if it's a small paste or a big square, you can take double-sided uh, tape, put it on the painter's tape. You can um, uh, even use a hot glue gun on that, but it will not, painter's tape will always break free. It will not hurt, hurt your wall. Here's the instructions for the easel and uh, a homemade bulletin board out of those tri-section science project things, the foam ones. Mm -hmm and uh, instructions on that. Then on the back, instructions on how to make a PVC mobile wall. So as we, any questions you have for me? That's awesome. <laughs> well, it's a bit of delight, and there's lots of things that I probably should have said that I forgot.
So it happens when you get old. I used to know a lot of stuff, but nothing is nothing is new. Don't be afraid to ask uh, ask your friends, ask other churches. Look around Pinterest. I I'm not a real computer girl anymore, but I got on Pinterest looking for visuals, and I was shocked. Even at the religious content, if you, if you type in Sunday school bullet boards, all kinds of things. But uh, but I I I've never had a budget for for children's ministry. I've always had to beg and get get creative. So I encourage you to get a creative team together and collaborate on what you can do with your space. Thank you for your kind attention. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for our brains, for our minds that you've given us. We thank you for creativity that comes from you. And help us, Lord, to not overshadow your word, but help us to adorn. This is awesome. So good. <laughs> Kitty and I are. Uh, we don't have enough kids to live anymore. Uh, Let me tell you, years. something about Awana. My son is 50 now, but he grew up in the Awana program. And in 1991, he had a terrible head injury and was in a drug induced coma for six weeks. And when he came out, he had a couple weeks that he was kind of in and out and then did not really have a sense of reality when he was fully awake. But you know what he remembered? I used to sing his Awana verses to him to make him learn them. And, and then when he was laying in that bed, I would sing, Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord God is with you, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua, I see that over and over again. He remembered that Awana verse. Hmm. And I'm thrilled with Awana. And you have um, Quest. Quest. Mm -hmm. But these programs that puts the Word of God in their minds, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. No, it's here. 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 It's